Mark Cote is the publisher of Corrent Books, a literary publishing house noted for the discovery and development of Canadian writing talent and the publishing of Quebecois fiction translated into English. He won Canada's Libris Award. That's from all the booksellers, right, Mark? Yep. Yes, it is. For Editor of the Year twice and for small presses three times. Different award, same organization. At Cormorant, Mark has acquired and edited many award-nominated books. Welcome to the Bibliophile Book Club, Mark. Thank you, Nigel. Now, because we're Canadian, we're going to talk about an American book, and that book is The Great Gatsby. It was published in 1925, novel, by the American writer F. Scott Fitzgerald. It's set in the Jazz Age on Long Island, and it depicts narrator Nick Carraway's relationship with the mysterious millionaire Jay Gatsby and Gatsby's obsession to reunite with his former lover, Daisy Buchanan. And now we're going to follow the text together. And uh, this could take a long time, but it's going to be a good time. I can just tell. So what's the first thing that you found interesting, Mark? Well, I've always seen the novel as um, an indictment of the society that Nick belongs to, or grew up in. And in the second paragraph, Nick Carraway reminds us that his father told him, whenever you feel like criticizing anyone, just remember that all the people in this world haven't had the advantages you've had. And he really lays it out at the beginning. I'm one of these people and I hold everything that they've done abhorrent. Blame. Everything that, that who's done? Um, everything that his class, his society, the careless people, he finds okay. it abhorrent. Because of course the book is written, the novel takes place after Gatsby's dead. Yeah. Boiler alert. <laughs> yeah, I think that's one of the endings we, the world knows. Um, he, he lays out this interesting line. He says, when I came back from the East last autumn, so he's back home in the Midwest, I felt that I wanted the world to be in uniform and at a sort of moral attention forever. I wanted no more rioter, riotous excursions with privileged glimpses into the human heart. Only Gatsby, who gives his name to this book, was exempt from my reaction. Gatsby, who represented everything for which I have an unaffected scorn. Boom. That's it. Everything thereafter is his, um, his way of indicting his, I think, his entire class. What do you think? My question is, why is he exempting Gatsby? Gatsby, of course, isn't born to it. He earned it himself. He came from poverty. He basically is an exemplar of the American dream. Yes. Rags to riches. So perhaps that's why Nick is letting him off the hook. He isn't one of these careless, born to money types. He's a dreamer. He's an achiever. He's mysterious. I'm going to say the true unrequited love story of the novel is Nick's love for Gatsby. We'll get to that a few, a few pages along. I completely agree. Gatsby believed in the dream and yeah. Gatsby was the victim. He achieved what most people think is what you should achieve. Yeah. What you could achieve. But I want to go uh, back uh, a few paragraphs to... Okay. This is the third paragraph with Nick saying, I'm inclined to reserve all judgments, a habit that has opened up many curious natures. Curious is, is an interesting word. And then a few lines further, because I was privy to the secret griefs of wild unknown men, perhaps his knowledge of other homosexual men 
What do you think? Nigel, I had never read that line and seen that, but the minute you started to read it, I thought, oh my God, it's there on page one. Page one. And I agree. He is privy to the secret griefs, the men who live in, in the shadows because their homosexuality makes them criminals. They're suppressed, exactly. Yeah. They, can't, they can't be who they really want to be. Right. I just wonder how all those little school marms taught that. <laughs> well, and in fact, if you go on and read the next sentence, most of the conf confidences were three. Frequently, I feigned sleep, preoccupation, or a hostile levity when I realized by some unmistakable sign that an intimate revelation was quivering on the horizon. It's right there. It's right, right there. there. He's feigning yeah. sleep. So yeah, when, exactly. do you feign, when do you feign sleep? Certainly not at a loud party with lots of music and dancing. Yeah. For the intimate revelations of young men, or at least the terms which, in which they express them, are usually plagiaristic and marred by obvious suppressions. Here we are, right there. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this is a famous line here. This is page five of my text. No, Gadsby turned out all right at the end. It is what preyed on Gadsby, what foul dust floated in the wake of his dreams that temporarily closed out my interest in the abortive sorrows and short-winded elations of men. What do you make of that? I'm going to go up a bit and say, if personality is an unbroken series of successful gestures, then there was something gorgeous about him, some heightened sensitivity to the promises of life, as if he were related to one of those intricate machines that register earthquakes 10,000 miles away. It was an extraordinary gift for hope, a romantic readiness such as I have never found in any other person and which is not likely I shall ever find again. Okay. Gatsby turned out all right in the end. I think, I think that certainly if you get to the end of the book, uh, Fitzgerald and Nick do not believe in the American dream. They think it's hogwash. Certainly Nick does not like the people living the American dream, the careless people of Tom and Daisy Buchanan, but he holds Gatsby immune from his scorn. Gatsby believed in the dream probably more than Tom and Daisy because they didn't have to believe in it. They got to live it. Well, they didn't have to do anything to achieve it. Right. It was their birthright. So I think that's what that, where that line's going, those, that sentence is going, yeah. I think that uh, he loves Gatsby because Gatsby is a dreamer. Gatsby is a romantic. Gatsby held this flame for a daisy. He's sensitive. He's not careless. He's driven by a desire to get her back, to win her love, to get back to the way it used to be. The true American dream, except the problem is reality steps in. Time marches forward, not backwards. I think, it, I think these are truths that are eternal. No matter how successful a person is, it takes a few generations before that money, that wealth, actually gives, them a gives the family a sense of having arrived. So for the first generation, they're arrivistes, uh, uh, nouveau, nouveau riches, they're all these things. And that's what Gatsby was. He did not belong, no matter how wealthy he was. He wasn't accepted by no. the moneyed class. Right, the born to moneyed class. Okay. So where do you, where's your next line that jumps out at you? I'm stuck on the homosexual uh, theme here. I think the way that he describes, but this is a bit further along, the way he describes Tom Buchanan is a little bit over the top. It was a body, this is on my page 11. You're, you're talking about the lines, among various physical accomplishments had and been one of the most powerful ends that ever played football at New Haven. A national figure in a way. One of those men who reached such an acute limited excellence at 21 that every, everything afterward, or everything afterwards savors of anticlimax. A bit further on, 
but that's interesting. I did see that. And, and of course, that does make you think of the football star who you meet 20, 30 years down the road, who's working at the beer store. <laughs> right. So you're, you're referring to the, um, I think the line is a pack of muscle. Yes, that's it. A great pack of muscle shifting when his shoulders moved under his thin coat. It was a body capable of enormous leverage, a cruel body. That's a little bit too much for a heterosexual guy to, to spend time on my sense. That's my sense. He had changed since his New Haven years. Now he was a sturdy, straw-haired man of 30 with a rather hard mouth and a supercilious manner. Two shining, arrogant eyes that established dominance over his face and gave him the appearance of always leaning aggressively forward. Not even the effeminate swank of his riding clothes could hide the enormous power of that body. He seemed to fill those glistening boots until he strained the top lacing, and you could see a great pack of muscle shifting when his shoulder moved under his thin coat. It was a body capable of enormous leverage. That's too much, Mark. That's too much. Yeah, I, I agree. It, I, it, this, is, this is a generalization, but I think it's fair to say straight male narrators tend not to notice other men's bodies to that degree. Yeah, that's my point. Toward the end of that page, the word restlessly comes up, and uh, that's that you see that throughout the entire novel. Yes. You could interpret that in all sorts of different ways. It's a restless time. But if we're if we're sticking on homosexuality, you know, a suppression of urges would probably make you pretty restless. Uh, no arguing there. There's a scene following where he's, um, Nick and Tom walk through a high hallway into a bright rose colored space, fragilely bound to the house by French windows at either end. The windows were ajar and gleaming white against the fresh grass outside that seemed to grow a little way into the house. A breeze blew through the room, blew curtains in at one end and out the other like pale flags, twisting them up towards the frosted wedding cake of the ceiling, then rippled over the wine-colored rug, making a shadow on it as wind does on the sea. It reminded me of the scene in Proust, the curtains and the windows in Hotel in Normandy. Yep, yep. Bing, bing, bing. I, I'm not a literary historian, so I don't know if at this point in his life Fitzgerald had read Proust. So it could be just one of those true coincidences, or it could be Fitzgerald tipping his hat to Proust. Um, you no, know, it's interesting because not that long ago, I, I read quite closely uh, Truman Capote's Mojave, and there's also quite a beautiful painterly scene like this in Mojave. I have not gone back and reread Truman Capote stories that you discussed, and I'm going to because of that, that particular bibliophile. There, there's a great writer who's gone, whose reputation has declined, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, I guess partly because of the way his life went. We won't get into Truman though. Although uh, Fitzgerald, had a similar problem. Well, alcohol. Alcohol, and they lived very large lives, very public lives. A lot of the energy went into the life and not the writing. Well, also probably a sense of failure. Even if they didn't fail, there was this sense of failure. Fitzgerald died without knowing that uh, Gatsby would turn into what many consider to be the great American novel. Right, he, he, he died with what would be his masterpiece or some consider his masterpiece out of print. His books were failures, they were not selling anymore. Continuing to write, but he was more of a liability in Hollywood than he was, than he was a success. He would write for the films and they would pay him and throw it away. Apparently he wrote dialogue for Gone with the Wind that they never used. But uh, in Truman's case, Truman wasn't able to write. He really did suffer from writer's block. Okay, I'm on page 21 now. Okay. And this is uh, Jordan Baker, the... The golfer. The, the, yes, the young woman. The, and I don't know if he's been set up. She's set up with Nick or... But anyway, they're together. She's a friend of Daisy's. Yes. Actually, it's interesting. Baker and Jordan apparently are both names of cars. And 
cars are so important to the 20s. Yes. The, the numbers of cars went from, you know, a few million up to 15 or two. it was a gigantic increase in the number of cars on the on the road, the Model Model T and such. And, yeah. and that's such an important part of that period, not to mention being a status symbol. Anyway, that this line here is Miss Baker and I exchanged a short glance, consciously devoid of meaning. I don't think he's too turned on by her. And again, uh, not to belabor the point. She's a, we know why. Ath- She's a professional athlete. She was a slender, small-breasted girl with an erect yeah. carriage, throwing her body backwards at the shoulders like a young cadet. You could say that, okay, she looks like a boy, but you could say she's a lesbian too. Well, that's one of the things that I did think, and that this is an acknowledgement because Daisy is putting them together. I think this is an acknowledgement that Daisy is thinking, here's a nice white marriage. They, they can marry, marry each other, they'll be covered, they're good to go. There's a description of Daisy here. She something with tense gaiety. Yes. And this, this comes up all the time. This, these little contradictory phrases that he f- throws in throughout the text. It's like, how do you have a tense gaiety for fuck's sake? It's interesting. It keeps you reading, but it's contradictory. It's like prohibition during the jazz age. <laughs> right. Um, well, let's think of enforced gaiety as well. She's having her cousin over for dinner. The marriage to her husband is clearly at, at, at rock bottom already. She's putting her cousin together with her friend, the possible lesbian professional golfer. And she's not a happy camper. And there's a tense gaiety there. Okay, so in other words, it's fake. Is that what you're saying? Yes, it's veneer. Right, and again, it's like the American dream. It's fake. Yes. What's your next? I I a bit from where you are to uh, the scene where they're at the dinner table. And you make me feel uncivilized, Daisy. I confessed on my second glass of corky, but rather impressive claret. Speaking of contradictions built in, right? A corky claret is not a good claret. It's not impressive, no. No. Can't you talk about crops or something? And he's playing on their Middle West background, Midwest background. Yeah. I meant nothing in particular by this remark, but it was taken up in an unexpected way. Civilizations going to pieces, broke out Tom violently. I've gotten to be a terrible pessimist about things. Have you read The Rise of the Colored Empires by this man Goddard? And then he goes on to expound what we today would call white supremacist viewpoints. Goddard is really a man named Stoddard. Scott is referencing a very specific book. This this man, Stoddard, was one of the great proponents of eugenics. Right. Taken up by the Nazis. He's part of not the core of the Nazis. There's no mistaking it. If you look up the history, he's right in there. So what's the point uh, relevant to the book? Well, it's clear that Nick is viewing this conversation from the outside. He's reporting on it and he's not interested. He's interested only as an observer. Although at the end of the book, when he talks, when Nick talks about the careless people, he is specifically referring to Gatsby and the role that Tom and Daisy played in Gatsby's murder. There's the death of Myrtle. There's Gatsby's murder. There's the suicide of, of Wilson. The detective story. These, yeah. <laughs> Tom and Daisy are responsible for the death of three pe- deaths of three people. And it comes out of attitudes like this. We are the natural ruling race. We have to keep everybody down. We have to be aware that no one can rise up against us. And I think that that really is in the book. And he, because he says, they retreated. Yeah, that's in- not racial, though. I mean, it, the murders aren't racial. They're the class. class. Yeah. And in 1924, the, the lower classes weren't just Myrtle and Wilson. They no. were the last numbers of Black people living in America were lower yeah. class. In fact, that there is this scene a bit further on where Nick laughs incredulously at the fact that there are three black people in a limousine and a white person driving the limousine. 
I don't know if you've gotten gotten to to it yet. Basically, it is like, who on earth would believe that this is happening these days? Right. You know, what's next? How did Tom's family make their money? It could be bootlegging. It could be slavery. No, it couldn't be bootlegging because Tom's no, family sorry. had money for many, many generations. That, that's right. It's, it's Gatsby that made the money bootlegging. Uh, and, rigging, and rigging the World Series. If he's in on that, yes. yes. But he and Meyer Wolfsheim are... Yes, that's true. So we've got anti-Semitism in the mix as well. Yeah. No, of course, you're right. It's slavery. It's slavery, yeah. Even Daisy, in that conversation, Tom's expounding these theories about how the Nordic races have done everything good. You know, it's scientific. We're the dominant race. We're civilized. And Daisy's, Daisy says, we've got to beat them down, whispered Daisy, yeah. winking ferociously. Again, that's, that's a typical line from Fitzgerald. Yeah. How do you wink ferociously? It's too much. Yeah. But is it overwritten? To me, it's charming, but other people think it's overwritten. I don't think it's overwritten. I think he's trying to really stress a point because what he wants people to really understand is Daisy isn't at this point buying this. And don't forget, Daisy's mother or father is his aunt or uncle, right? So one is going to presume that perhaps uh, their, their fathers were brothers. And it's it's it's... Nick who said, remember, not everybody grew up with our privileges. It's not unreasonable to think that perhaps Daisy grew up with that same moral upbringing. What, that same racist upbringing? No, 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 no. That she's not racist at this point like Tom. That's right. Okay, so she was born with decency. Yeah, she, well, she was taught decency by, by her father, we'll, we'll presume, or maybe her mother. She's not buying Tom's line. The next thing that jumps out to me is uh, page 25, the top 25. And I've got a paperback, uh, Scribner's. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. It's, uh, well, she was less than an hour old, and Tom was God knows where, about the daughter, their daughter. Yes. And this is probably one of the most famous lines from the book. I'm glad it's a girl. And I hope she'll be a fool. That's the best thing a girl can be in this world. A beautiful little fool. Yeah. So what does that mean, Mark? Well, I'm going to go back to the tense gaiety, the enforced gaiety, the veneer. Be beautiful, you'll get a pass. And if people see that you're beautiful, they're not going to expect anything more of you. So in other words, don't, don't flaunt your intelligence because men don't like that? Now, this is interesting because I was going to say at the time and of the class, smart women weren't liked, but that is, actually isn't true. At the time and of the class, smart women were liked. Don't forget, this is Margaret Mead is, is, is coming into prominence right at this moment. She's No, no, it's too no, early. No, no, no. Too early for her. No, she's, she's in grad school. Or she's just graduated grad school. Mid twenties. Yes, uh, and I, I and I know this because I I actually know somebody whose godmother was Margaret Mead. The other interesting thing is that we just have the women getting the vote too. Yes, exactly. And what also is interesting for me, my friend Sally, in Margaret Mead's book, Blackberry Winter, it's about her early years growing up, etc. And she, her best friend was Bunny Todd, my friend Sally Todd Nelson's mother. And in Blackberry Winter, Margaret Mead says, Bunny was the woman on whom Scott Fitzgerald based his descriptions of a flapper. Bunny Todd and Margaret Mead and their friends were all very, very smart. So it's interesting for Daisy to sort of say, be a beautiful fool. I think perhaps she's saying more about herself than she is about anything else. She's the beautiful fool. After all, when she left, was it Cincinnati? The whole town painted their left rear tires black in mourning for her leaving. She was, you know, the desirable, beautiful girl of the day. 
this is just at the end of chapter one, the silver pepper of the stars. And then there's reference to the famous green light. And now he has purchased a mansion right across the bay from bay. where Daisy and Tom live so that he can <laughs> keep an eye on them and make it clear that he's right there. Uh, I guess hoping he'll encounter her so that he can fulfill his dream of reuniting with her. But it's some gorgeous, gorgeous prose there. Yes, um, you, you skipped ahead. There's something I'll, I'll raise. The conversation goes on over dinner. Tom has gone away to answer the phone. He comes back. Did you and Nick have a little heart to heart talk on the veranda? Demanded Tom. Did I? She looked at me. I can't seem to remember. But I think we talked about the Nordic race. Yes, I'm sure we did. It sort of crept up on us. And if, I think that's an example of Izzy being a beautiful fool. But then later, this is, this is important. She says, as I started my motor, Nick's got in his car and he's driving away, Daisy peremptorily called, wait, I forgot to ask you something and it's important. We heard you were engaged to a girl out West. Tom corroborated kindly. We heard that you were engaged. It's a libel, I'm too poor. But we heard it, insisted Daisy, surprising me by opening up again in a flower-like way. We heard it from three people, so it must be true. Of course, I knew what they were referring to, but I wasn't even vaguely engaged. The fact that gossip had published the bands was one of the reasons I had come east. You can't stop going with an old friend on account of rumors. And on the other hand, I had no intention of being rumored into marriage. An interesting commentary on Gatsby and our society's attitude toward uh, homosexuals. It really hasn't come to the fore, you know, this interpretation, and yet it's so patently obvious. I don't think it matters if, for example, he's actually a sexually practicing gay or he just happens to love Gatsby and be oriented toward men. I don't think it's a huge impact on the novel one way or the other. The homosexuality, how it works, I think, in the novel is it allows Nick to be of the society, of the class he's writing about, and at the same time to be an outsider from it. Right. He doesn't that, have to be homosexual to, to, to have that. Think of Proust, right? I'm going to say this. There is a split consciousness for people who... Your parent, you're a boy. Your parents presume you're straight. Your parents right. presume a lot of things about you. Your friends presume a lot of things about you. And you know something they don't. And that gives you the ability to see them a little more clearly. Yeah, you're um, more sensitive, certainly. And it, it, it reminds me of, as well, I don't know, did you ever see the play or the movie? The movie was brilliant. Six Degrees of Separation. I saw the play in New York. Okay, there's a wonderful line when, when they're, the, the kids are trying to figure out who did you go to school with who might possibly be gay, who blah, blah, blah. And it, oh, Trent Conway, Trent Conway. And then you see Trent Conway and he says to the black character, he describes his society perfectly. Right. They're the Kittredges from Rhode Island, Newport. Not the first houses on the water, the houses behind the houses on the water. Clear view of everything. And the guy says, these are rich folk. And Trent Conway says, no, no, hand to mouth, but on a higher plane. <laughs> Trent Conway and Nick, and Nick Carraway are soulmates. And, and, and I want to go back to, to, to the other point, which is you raised, and this is interesting, despite all the social and intellectual changes in the last 50 years with gay liberation. People can still today write and get published novels about a heterosexualist named Nick Carraway. Jean Reese yes. wrote The Wide Sargasso Sea, which sort of blew Jane Eyre wide open, right? And that was one phrase. She had coarse features and kinky hair. That's it. Jean Reese focused in on it and blew that novel, and nobody's done that for Gatsby. No one's done that for Nick. Someone must have done this. I'm not aware of it. 
Now, again, I'm not a Fitzgerald scholar and I'm not in, in, in academia, so I'm not reading up on everything to know. But you did raise earlier the idea that nobody really does discuss this. That is true. And it's also, don't touch our classic. Don't make it a gay novel. I'm assuming the role of a uh, straight, white yeah. lover of the canon who right. says, don't do that. Okay? Oh, we can, just, we can just, instead of um, making it vague, we can say David Gilmore. David Gilmore has a manuscript, which I think is going to be published now. It, it was offered to us. And it's, as he put it, a retelling of Gatsby. Okay. About a third of the manuscript. And I wrote to David and I said, well, there's one problem. <laughs> Nick Carraway is gay. And <laughs> David was, no. Boom. Right. There is a great resistance to allowing Nick Carraway to be gay. I think we're coming to the end of chapter one. Let's just go to the last couple of paragraphs and then let's call it a day for okay. this particular session. All right. And then pick up uh, or not pick up depending oh, no, we will. On... okay no 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 this is this is fun well i hope it's fun for the listeners too that's the important thing you know the last paragraph of chapter one i decided to call him miss baker had mentioned him at dinner and that would do for an introduction but i didn't call to him for he gave a sudden intimation that he was content to be alone he stretched out his arms towards the dark water in a curious way, and far as I was from him, I could have sworn he was trembling. Involuntarily, I glanced seaward and distinguished nothing except a single green light, minute and far away, that might have been the end of a dock. When I looked once more for Gatsby, he had vanished, and I was alone again in the unquiet darkness. Yeah. He's trembling. He's trembling. And Gatsby vanishes into the night. That's right. It's because what? He's not allowed to have him? No, I think he just vanishes. In a sense, he vanishes into the dream. He literally vanishes into the night that produces the dream for him. No? He's trembling because he wants to achieve his dream so much. He wants yes. her so much. He's afraid he's not going to get her. Yes? I, is it he's afraid he's not going to get her? I understand the sexual emotional trembling. Sexual trembling, yeah. As a anticipation when you're with someone, but I don't think I don't know if that's what Gatsby's experiencing right there. Well, um Fitzgerald I think did point out that never in the entire novel do Daisy and Gatsby have sexual congress. <laughs> right. They're actually so, quite chaste. Um, so why is he trembling then? I think it's still sexual tension. I really do. I think it's, he's trembling with, with hope, with sexual tension, with desire, with all sorts of things. Okay. It's across the water from him. The girl who was everything he wanted in life. That's right. It's so, his dream is so close. He's so far. <laughs> he's reaching across the, the gap and he wants it so much that he's trembling. Yeah. And then he disappears and how does that make our, our friend Nick feel? Well, I, I, it certainly makes Gatsby kind of a, a romantic figure that you look away and he suddenly, and you look back and he's gone, whoa, I just had a bird fly into our window. <laughs> That's the end of the dream there, Mark. Yes, it certainly is. It's a rude awakening. This is interesting because he says he's alone in the unquiet darkness. Night. Yes. So again, is, is this the place that a gay person is? He's not able to be himself? No, Gatsby's disappeared and he's standing there in his yard and You've been in the country before. I love people who think the country is quiet. You know, there are yeah. thousands of, of insects and birds and critters making lots and lots and lots of noise. I okay. think that that is. That's just a, a description of, of what it's like in. He's an East Egg, isn't he? Well, which is the Nouveau Riche? Is it East or West? 
we should we should know that <laughs> actually actually uh, they're not necessarily nouveau riche they're just not rich period well the, you know you're talking about the valley of ashes which isn't east or west no. egg. that's where they're poor a west egg village is is where they where nick is across the way is east egg the next chapter we go into the uh the valley of of ashes the valley of ashes so that's where uh, we'll leave it and okay. uh, allow me to thank you very much for uh, participating in the Bibliophile Book Club, Great Gatsby edition. Uh, Mark Cote is the publisher of Cormorant Books and a very sophisticated close reader. <laughs> okay. <laughs>